I smelled the man before I really saw him. I'd caught the swirl of his black overcoat around his suit pants over the edge of my phone, but I was reading an email and I'm not in the habit of looking up at every person that gets in an elevator with me, especially at the office. But the smell was a thick, musky smell that prickled my nose, reminding me of a curious and fair more than the sense I was used to running into on any of the building's 52 floors. I glanced up at the floor counter first, 22, and I was headed up to 48. I had no idea where the elevator's new occupant was going, but I decided to sneak a peek at him while I had the chance. My first thought was that he looked like an old stage magician coming to visit his accountant. He wore a threadbare black coat over a long gray suit with shiny lapels and a purple tie that was so wide and billowy it almost looked like a cravat. His hair was long and gray and thick and parted in the middle like Moses spreading the Red Sea. And below it, a thin gray mustache trailed down both sides of his mouth like a drooping runoff from that larger body of water. Maybe I stared too long. It was a lot to take in. And once I started looking at him, I was kind of fascinated. That was a mistake, though. The dark eyes nesting under his jutting salt and pepper eyebrows found me, lighting up as his gaze locked onto mine. Well, hello, miss. How do you do? I offered an awkward nod. I'm fine. How are you? He chuckled. There was a moment of silence as I turned back to the elevator door. We were on 29 now. I could just make it a few more seconds without him trying to strike, but... So, do you work in the building, miss? God damn it. Yes, I do. Insurance company on the 48th floor. I wanted to stay quiet and let the conversation die, but... I couldn't help but add... So where are you heading to? The older man gave me a rasping chuckle. <laughs> Oh, I'm just out running errands. You know how it goes. Another brief pause that gave me hope he was dashed as he added, It's funny. When I was young, I hated errands and chores. Now I look forward to them. It gives me something to do. Idle hands and all. He waved his hand in demonstration, and I noticed that three of his fingertips had crudely wrapped yellowing tape on them. I gave a hollow laugh. <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's how it goes. 36. This was the slowest elevator in the world. Well, it wasn't always that way. When my wife was alive, we never ran out of things to do, but... Since she passed, well... I guess I'm at loose ends. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry for your loss, I mean... He didn't answer right away, and I could see him watching me out the corner of my eye, his face slack and expressionless for a moment before snapping back into a grin. I see you the same, miss. I appreciate the sentiment, and, and don't feel too bad for me. I do still keep busy. Hobbies and all. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good. His voice stayed light as he went on. For example... I trained a monkey to cut brake lines. I turned to stare at him. What? Did you say you trained a monkey to... C I lurched against the wall of the elevator car as the entire thing ground to a swift halt. The lights went out for a moment and then came back on with a flicker. Fuck. I looked up at the floor counter was flickering too, jumping back and forth between 44 and 45. Shit. I think we're stuck. I hit the emergency call button once, and then again, but nothing happened. Turning to look at the man, I saw he was smiling at me. Monkeys are funny creatures, you know. Not as close to us as apes, but they still think like people, not animals. Sir, we're stuck, so we need to find a way to get help. 
I'm going to try my phone, okay? He went on, staring at me but not reacting to my words. Animals... They don't hate without reason, do they? No, they understand as much as we do, I think, and some can be quite cruel. But I think their evils are much more rational than humans. Or monkeys. Looking down at my phone, I started by trying to call the office's main line. A monkey can hate, can enjoy hating. It can be taught a great many things, and where there's a capacity for cruelty in its heart, that dark fire can be nurtured. No ringing or answer, and when I looked at my phone again, I saw there was no signal. Fuck. i lost calls writing on this thing before. And now this creepy guy was talking about monkeys hating people or some weird shit, and no. I'd had enough of this. Sir, I'm not trying to be rude, but I don't care about whatever monkey thing you're trying to tell me. We need to get out of here. Do you have a phone we can try? He gave a small laugh and winked at me. <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. I don't carry one. And besides, they don't work well in here anyway, do they? I felt a slight chill at the way he said that last bit, but I pushed it aside. Punching in 911, I tried calling again, and then a second and third time when that failed. After that, I hit the emergency call button again as I yelled for someone to help us. Miss, miss, no need to strain your voice like that. The 44th and 45th floors are empty, are they not? I froze mid-yell. Is that right? I wasn't sure, but I, I think it was. There had been a big internet company on those floors at one point, but they shut down the year before. Had anyone else moved in? And... I kept my eyes toward the door, and I asked the question... That had surfaced in my mind. How do you know that? Do you work in the building? Me? Oh, no, miss, but that is right, I believe. I don't think anyone will hear us here. Glancing out of my forced smile. Maybe so, but it's okay. They'll notice the elevator is stuck soon enough and get us out. He gave a rueful nod. Hmm. I'm sure you're right, miss. I'm sure they would get us out if there was so much time, but... With a mechanical failure of this magnitude, I'll have to call the fire department and the elevator mechanic. Even if they are already calling now, which is doubtful, It'll take 16 and a half minutes for the first fire trucks to arrive, and another 20 before the elevator mechanic gets here. The elevators do get stuck, after all, and it's not seen as a big emergency that requires a big rush. Well, yeah, maybe so. But we'll be okay for 30 minutes in here. Trying to be pleasant, I added. You can tell me more about the monkeys if you want. Pass the time. And frowned slightly. I do appreciate your indulgence, but you misunderstand. The problem is that this car won't be here any more by the time anyone would come to the rescue. Raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? He let out a long, suffering sigh. <sighs> I do apologize. I've done a poor job explaining things. The monkey, my monkey, if one can be said to truly own such a creature, is the cause of the elevator stopping, and while we speak, he's currently tampering with the brakes on this car. Giving a shaky laugh, I took a step back, the railing of the car digging into the small of my back. <laughs> That's not funny. The man's expression didn't change, but his eyes sparkled as he went on. Oh, it's not a joke, miss. You see, the elevator brakes are designed to not fail. They use friction brakes on springs, and their default state, if they lose power, for instance, is to be engaged. To stop an elevator car from moving. 
So it is not enough to tamper with the electricity. You have to physically block the brakes from engaging. And that is precisely what my monkey is doing right now. You're crazy. That's, that's not possible. He shrugged. Your first assertion may be correct, though it's largely subjective and wholly irrelevant. As for your second, I can assure you it is very possible. I spent the last two years teaching my monkey to do a great many things, including learning when and how to stop this exact model of elevator, how to disable the brakes and emergency safeguards, and how to, when the time is right, send the car plummeting down to the bottom faster than any car should go. Stomach twisting, I tried 911 again. The man just watched me patiently, not fail. When I finally looked up at him, the smile was back. You see now? Are you beginning to understand? I heard the fear in my voice this time, shot through with confusion and anger. Why? Why are you saying this? Or doing this if it's a real thing. The man looked away then, staring up at the flickering floor numbers he began to speak. I once had three monkeys, you know. The other two weren't as smart as him, nor as cruel. When it came time for them to sort out who was coming with me, well, he was the only one with the stomach for the job of sorting. He glanced at me then, his expression merry. He loves his little straight razor. When he finished his business with the others, he brought it to me like an offering. You could barely see what it was then, so caked with his brother and sister's meat and hair and blood. He chuckled. <laughs> A blood offering to his god, I suppose. Shaking his head, he wiped at the corner of his eye. I cleaned it for him, of course, sharpened it back up, and threaded it on a chain he could wear around his neck. He sleeps with it on now, like a baby holding a favorite toy. Glancing at his watch, he frowned. But I'm going on too long. I need to take my leave. What are you t- ah! He brought up the pepper spray with a fast flourish, spraying me in the eyes before I could shut them and turn away. I dropped to my knees, screaming, scrubbing my eyes with the heels of my hand, unable to think or do anything in the face of such sudden, cramping fire. I realized distantly that the man had crouched down beside me and pressed something against my chest, but it wasn't until I heard him moving something at the door that I managed to croak out a few words. Are you... Are you opening the door? The blur in front of me turned in my direction for a moment. <laughs> well, yes, of course. I have to get out, don't I? But don't worry about me, miss. There's just enough space for me to slide open the doors to 45 and slip through. Take me to... Please. Oh, no, miss. That would defeat the point, wouldn't it? But to save you some time and worry, I'll let you in on a couple of secrets. First... When I leave, I'll be shutting the doors and locking them down. He snickered slightly. <laughs> that little monkey is the only one that's learned a few things about this elevator. Second, I wouldn't count on any help. Security only checks the empty floors at night, and I welded shut all the entry points to 44 and 45 an hour ago, including the other elevators. You're... you're lying. When he turned back and opened the inner door. Please, please take me with you. I'm not turning away from his work. I'm sorry, but no. But don't worry, you won't be alone forever. Why? Why are you doing this? Your monkey, your monkey's already cut the brake line, so can you just let me go, right? He could barely make out as he tugged the bottom of the upper floor's outer doors and nimbly climbed up and out before turning back to look at me. My poor girl. Haven't you heard anything I've said? Elevators don't have brake lines. With that, he pulled the inner door shut 
and a few seconds later, I heard the muffled sound of the doors to 45 being closed as well. I've spent the last 20 minutes recording this between trying to text or email or call someone that can help me sooner. I tell myself I'm just recording to pass the time and have a good record for the cops when I get out, but I'm starting to wonder. Because there's a small part of me that is afraid I won't ever get... Oh, God. Something's on top of the elevator. I can hear it moving around up there. It's walking around and moving something. What is... Fuck. One of the ceiling tiles just fell down. It's a hatch. Someone's coming to get me out. Oh, God. It's a monkey. I can see his face. His eyes. He's meeting my eyes, staring into them, and then he's looking down at... What the fuck is he looking at? Oh, God. He did this to me. When he touched me, he penned this on me, and I haven't noticed. It hurts so much, and I'm so scared I didn't see it before, and now the monkey has seen it. He's already fucking seen it. It's a little name tag. It's not really a name, but I don't think that matters. It just says... Break line. I just pulled it off, but it doesn't matter. I know he saw it. He's looking into my eyes again now, and I'm staying very still. I can't see all of him, but he's large. Barely small enough to fit through the hatch, I think. But when he decides to, I think he'll come through very fast. Oh, God. He just keeps... Staring at me, just staring, and... Wait, what is he doing? He's reaching up, still watching me, and is sliding something from around his neck. A small chain on the end of it. Oh, God. God, no. No! This concludes the transcribed recording of an audio file labeled phone recording from Jenna Morris. Claim number 22-J4589. Unauthorized copying of this recording may result in severe penalties. I'm not an unreasonable man. I feel like I'm fairly tolerant of others' odd behaviors and bizarre interests... Maybe I don't stay on the cutting edge of pop culture, or fringe culture, or whatever other cultures exist, but my motto has always been, live and let live. So when a new group started hanging out at the bar down the street, I noted it, but I didn't mind. At first, I thought it was kind of funny, if I'm being honest. Four grown people, dressed up in elaborate suits and dresses, complete with hats and capes and all manner of old-fashioned frippery. Well, at least mostly old-fashioned. Because if you looked closer, you'd see several strange glints of metal and glass that looked strangely anachronistic in the context of their get-ups. Or maybe anachronistic isn't the right word, as that stuff didn't look new either, but it didn't fit what they were wearing. Brass telescoping goggles, a glove made to mimic the appearance of a robot's hand, a face that looked like a cross between a gas mask and something... I'd expect to find in Amsterdam. All very detailed and authentic looking, if authentic is a term to be applied to such things. But ultimately, still very silly. So when I passed them the first time sitting in the beer garden at the fancy bar on my street, I couldn't help but let out a quiet chuckle. Apparently it hadn't been quiet enough. Two of the leather and lace trimmed quartet turned toward me. As I turned away, I saw one of the women flick a bejeweled middle finger in my direction. Feeling a combination of irritation and embarrassment, I trundled on home to ask my wife what the fuck it was I had just encountered. Sounds like Victorian steampunk, dear. I stared at Jessica with a kind of slack-jawed expectancy, feeling sure that there was some further explanation coming. That she hadn't thought that those five words would impart any kind of real knowledge. 
But then I could tell from her expression that she intended to leave me hanging, enjoying the scene of me dangling from my lonely branch of cultural ignorance. And what, my love, is Victorian steampunk? She glanced down at her cell phone as she made an attempt at looking distracted and slightly bemused. Hmm. I think it's like a cosplay or something? I felt a vein throb near my temple. She was enjoying this greatly. <laughs> I see. And what is this cosplay? I saw her suppressing a giggle as she looked back up at me. <laughs> Cosplay. You know, people dressed up like superheroes and aliens and shit. You really don't know about that? I think it'd be right up your alley. I gave her a dismissive sniff as I stepped into the kitchen to start fixing dinner. You'll have to forgive me if I don't fill my head with garbage. A light snicker from the other room. Shaking my head resignedly, I called to her. What do you want me to fix you? There was a pause. When she spoke, the mirth was out of her voice. I don't want anything. I'm not hungry. Letting out a quiet sigh, I went back into the living room and sat down on the sofa next to Jessica. You know you have to keep your strength up. You need food. She started to argue and I pressed a gentle finger to her lips. You need to do as I ask for the next few days, alright? Kissing my finger, she nodded. I'm sorry. I know what you're doing. That you're looking out for me, and I don't mean to make fun when you don't know stuff. I gave her a small smile and patted her leg. It's alright. I think I just feel insecure sometimes because you're younger than me. Things like this just remind me and make me feel a bit old sometimes. She leaned forward and kissed my lips. You're not old. You're perfect. Her eyes were shining with love when she pulled me back. And I would love some spaghetti with marinara. Beaming at her, I kissed her forehead and stood up. As you wish. Turned her head back into the kitchen when she called me again. Can I take this off tonight? She patted the padded chain around her waist. It was anchored to the floor in two different spots by steel eyelets run through with a fabric-wrapped chain that connected to the band that bound her. I made sure everything was quiet and soft so it wouldn't chafe, but I still hated seeing her like that. Not tonight, my love. But soon. Two nights later, the four had become eight. The new members weren't as elaborately costumed, but... They still stood out starkly from the rest of the patrons. I tried to avoid their attention as I passed, but I could feel their gaze on me nonetheless. I could hear one of them whispering to the others, that's the guy. I had a strong urge to stop and confront them there, but to what end? Was it a crime to be slightly rude or to whisper about a passerby? It was better to avoid any confrontation at all, particularly with everything already on my mind. I heard a few more snickering remarks as I went further toward home, but by the time I saw Jessica, I'd already forgotten them. It was the following Monday when the problems truly began, or at least my understanding that there was a genuine problem. These ne'er-do-wells, their ranks now swollen to eleven, blocks my path home. Asked me to come join them, and when I refused, pretended to take offense. Said I was stuck up, and thought I was better than them. Holding on to my self-restraint as tightly as I was able, I was resolved to just push through their blockade until one of them spoke again. She was a young girl, likely no more than twenty, but it was clear she was in charge. She called the others away, and like obedient ducklings, they crowded back behind her. Tipping her small black bowler at me, she raised the thick, filigreed monocle to her eye as she spoke. Be seeing you. They murdered Jessica the following afternoon. 
I knew what had happened as soon as I awoke in my shadowed chamber, and when I found her, I nearly lost my mind. They had savaged her body and wrapped her chain tightly around her neck. They had bitten and apparently eaten chunks of her flesh. I allowed myself only a few moments of blind rage and sorrow, as time was a luxury I did not have. I would have to act quickly if I were to set things right again. It took only a couple of phone calls to learn where I could find the sociopath that murdered my love. Once I knew where to find them, most of them anyway, I debated the best way of handling them. The most direct and efficient way lacked any real imagination or flair, and ultimately adding a little color to the proceedings would not add much time while providing the benefit of additional anonymity. So, I went to the plague chest. During the plague, doctors such as myself wore various contraptions to provide some measures of protection as we traversed the dead and attempted to heal the dying. Looking back on it now, both modern medicine and my own experiences make the garb of the plague doctor slightly tragic and humorous, but... I still remember the peace of mind it offered me to have that dark, heavy cloak and thick, almost raven-like mask between me and a world that had grown so hostile with madness and death. It didn't protect me from the bubonic plague, of course. I caught it and ultimately died, though. It was but a temporary state thanks to the tender mercies of Pina and her sister. They'd accomplished what I'd failed to do in twenty years of work thwart death. Perhaps the better phrase, the more correct idea would be that they struck a bargain with death. For my resurrection came at the cost of others' lives. As Pina always reminded me, everything must be paid for. Pulling the plague doctor mask on, I faded out into the night. Stop, okay? Just, just fucking stop. I'd found a group of seven of them, clustered up in a dark corner of a club across town. My sources had told me the murderers liked to make the rounds, and this was one of their frequent stops during the week. The man who was screaming was one of the two survivors, though that title would be, like so many things, brief and fleeting. I had already gotten close enough to smell him, to know what he did and didn't do. I'd already gotten close enough to the girl, the leader, to know that she led in the butchery and cruelty as well. To her credit, she didn't cry or beg, even when I ripped the head off the last frickin' Patriots. I could hear her heart hammering, but the only external noise she had made the entire time when I first appeared in the dark corner of the club and began killing them without word or explanation. It was a sound of surprise and confusion. Perhaps at my arrival, or perhaps at the fact that no one else in the club seemed to notice or care. I offered no explanation, and she asked for none. But then I reached for her, and she stabbed me in the arm. She was very quick, but not quick enough. I could have avoided the blow, but I wanted her to see her best efforts fail. I needed her to feel desperate and trapped as I snatched her up and spirited her away from the tattered remains of her strange gang. When she saw me pull the knife from my arm casually and toss it aside, I was happy to see rage and terror dancing in her eyes. And before you think less of me, please understand that my desire for her to be afraid was not merely petty retribution on my part, though I must admit it played a role. It would also make her blood and flesh potent for my sweet Jessica. When the girl stood at the edge of her bed, my hand at the back of her neck, she looked down at my wife's ruined corpse and began to laugh. I could sense the evil and insanity radiating off of her, and it took considerable will to not crush her neck to powder. But no. She was the one most responsible for sending Jessica to death before we were ready, and she would be the most apt offering to get her back. I just prayed that it was enough. 
The first sign that it was working was the sound of the killer's manic laughter changing. She sounded like an engine, slowly dying as the tattered flesh and broken bones before her began to stir in her presence. The offering had been accepted, after all. Shoving the girl forward, I slid her neck just enough to start things flowing before easing her down into my wife's embrace. The murderess tried to struggle and flail as her faded laughter was replaced by a high-pitched wail that might have been meant as begging for mercy. Such a foolish concept, and particularly futile one, once my love wrapped her arms tightly around the girl and began to feed. Half an hour later, it was done. Jessica was smiling at me again with a light in her eyes that now would never fade or go out. She gestured for me to join her on the remains of the vile thing that had tried to take her from me. I nodded eagerly. Just a moment. I began to pull the plague doctor's mask free from my head as I turned. Let me just put these things away and I'll... Jessica shook her head, giggling. No, leave it on. Cosplay is cool. Chuckling, I pushed the mask back down and regarded her through the wavy glass eyes of the old death crow. <laughs> As you wish. Hey everyone. I hope you enjoyed tonight's stories. I know I did. I liked them both a lot. They were both really interesting, and they've kind of been on my radar for a while now. For a good, good long while. But for some reason, I just haven't really gotten around to recording them. Finally, I did, and I'm glad I did, because I really liked them, as I said. Um, let me know what you thought in the comments section below. And while you're down there, I would like you to answer a question for me. Given that cosplay was kind of a big part of this story, more or less... What do you do in your free time? What's your hobby? What do you like to do when you're not at work or running errands or anything like that? What are some things that you enjoy doing in your free time? Is it cosplay? I would love to know. I know I've had some people say that they love to paint while they listen. Some people say that um, they make music. A bunch of other really cool stuff that you guys and gals and everyone else does. So... So let me know down below what you do as a hobby. I'd be really interested to start a conversation about that. Share a little bit about ourselves. You know, kind of like a share with the class situation. Uh, me personally, don't really have that many hobbies, if I'm honest. Um, I do try to write, but it hasn't happened lately. Other than that, I just play a whole lot of Fortnite, if I'm being completely honest. I really like video games. I guess you could say that's my hobby. Recently played Resident Evil 2 Remake. It was a lot of fun. Um, currently waiting for God of War Ragnarok to come out. So, yeah. I'd say video games is my biggest hobby, biggest pastime. Let me know also what's some, what some of your favorite uh, video games down in the comment section below as well. And huge thanks to everyone on screen right now. I haven't said that yet. Sorry about that. Those are our $5 patrons and members. If you want to become one and get a shout out at the end of each video can do so. Links are down in the description. Or you can become a $1 patron or member and get videos a day in advance. So, thanks again everyone for listening. Let me know what your hobbies are down in the comment section below. And let me know what your favorite video game is. I'd love to hear it. Take care everyone, and as always, stay safe out there. <laughs>